Hi, everyone. Welcome to Algorithm Seminar. I'm uh, really happy to have uh, Josh here to give a talk. Uh, he's an assistant professor of computer science at Columbia University. Uh, he works on algorithm design and complexity theory, focusing especially on algebraic tools for speeding up algorithms. Uh, please welcome our speaker. Thank you. Hello. Um, all right. So I'm going to tell you today about algorithms and hardness for attention and kernel density estimation, which are two algorithmic problems. Um, this is joint work with Amol Agarwal, who's a, a math professor at Columbia, Yunfeng Guan, who's one of my fantastic PhD students, and Zhao Song, who's a longtime collaborator. Um, yeah, please you know, feel free to interrupt and ask questions throughout the talk. Um, OK, so let me tell you first about what is kernel density estimation. Um, or maybe if you've heard of it before, I'm specifically going to talk about batch kernel density estimation. Um, so this is it's an algorithmic problem. Um, and to define it, you first have to fix a kernel function. So there's a function that takes in two points uh, in m-dimensional space and returns a number. Um, and we usually want to think of a kernel function so that uh, when x and y are close, then f of xy is big. And when x and y are far, then f of xy is small. So like some of the most common examples that I'll focus on are like the, the Gaussian kernel, like e to the minus the squared distance between x and y, or uh, a polynomial kernel, like one over some polynomial in the distance between x and y. OK, so think of fix, for ex you can think throughout this talk of just fixing the Gaussian kernel, let's say. Um, so in this kernel density estimation problem, you're given as input two endpoints, like n x points and n y points um, and they're m dimensional points and you should think of m as much smaller than n like maybe m is like log n um, and these points they're they're not too far away from each other maybe there's some bound that they're square diameters at most some number b um, so you're given as input these points as well as an input vector w and an error parameter epsilon um, so in terms of these points you uh, implicitly define what's called the kernel matrix. So this is an n by n matrix whose i comma j entry is the kernel function evaluated at uh, points xi and xj. Um, so you define this kernel matrix in terms of your input, input points. And then the goal is to approximately compute the product of the kernel matrix and the input vector w. So that's, that's our goal. We want to define this matrix in terms of the input points and then multiply it times the input vector. And uh, we, it's used in pretty much every application, it's fine to just approximately rather than exactly compute this. So more specifically, what I'll want is uh, vector V so that the, the L infinity error is at most, say, epsilon times the, the L1 norm of, of the input vector W. All right, so this is, this is the problem I'm gonna talk about throughout this talk. Uh, and just to remind you of the parameters, I'll, I'll keep it in this like blue box on the slide throughout most of the talk. Um, so, uh, well, how quickly can we solve this problem? Well, the straightforward algorithm runs in about m n squared time. And we're thinking of m as much smaller than n, so there's like quadratic time in n. Um, how does it work? You just construct this matrix k. Uh, you can figure out what all n squared entries of k are. Then you multiply it by the vector in n squared time. OK. Uh, but this is a problem where we could hope for a much faster algorithm. So the input size to this problem is only m times n. It's only about linear in n. You're just given as input these n points in this vector of length n. Uh, and the output size is just a vector of length n as well. So even though the straightforward algorithm is quadratic time, the input size is only linear time. So when m is a lot smaller than n, you could hope for a much faster algorithm it just can't explicitly compute this kernel matrix k in the middle because it's like k has n squared entries. So it would take n squared time to compute that matrix. But you could hope for a faster algorithm that, that somehow it implicitly makes use of the matrix M. Um, and, and just to emphasize, this is like, there's there's a lot of parameters to this problem. There's like the n, the number of input vectors. There's M, the input dimension. There's B, the square, the diameter. There's epsilon, the tolerance for error. And there's, of course, F, the kernel function you're actually dealing with. And 
Uh, well, what I'll tell you about today is how, you know, depending on these five parameters, uh, it can make a big difference whether or not it's possible to design a faster algorithm. Um, but before I get into the details, let me tell you about a few different applications and um, especially how really different applications of this problem motivate different parameter regimes. Um, okay, so the first the first application when uh, uh, probably the, the first one that kernel density estimation was was defined for is a problem in statistics of estimating the probability density function of a random variable. So like, um, well, kind of more specifically, there's some distribution that's unknown to you. You draw a bunch of points from it, and then you want to estimate the probability density the function of the distribution at, at a bunch of query points. Um, okay, this is this is a this is a nice like kind of basic statistics question, um, and the idea is that yeah, if you pick your kernel function appropriately, depending on what statistical guarantees you want exactly, then the sum, like the average of the kernel uh, evaluated at the pairs of the, the, the data points you drew from the distribution in your query point uh, gives a good uh, estimate of the PDF at that query point. So like, for example, uh, let's say, let's focus on the simplest case when M equals one. So we're just drawing a D the distribution of numbers. Um, then we can get the histogram of our samples from D if we pick the Ys to just be evenly spaced points along the line and our kernel function to be this like threshold that's like one if the, the points are at most half from each other and zero otherwise. You get like a, a histogram like this when you take the average of, of this kernel evaluated all the pairs of things. Okay, uh, but normally in most applications, um, yeah, and then, and then uh, you can you can evaluate this using kernel density estimation by multiplying the kernel matrix times the all one vector and then dividing by n. Okay. Um, nor normally in 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 statistics they use other other kernel functions and I think that maybe the most common one is the Gaussian kernel even in this setting where instead of kind of this discrete a bunch of boxes you want like a more smooth estimate of what the PDF of your distribution looks like. Okay, so that's the kind of the first, the first, uh, the first application of this KD. Uh, but maybe the application I think where that that more more popularized it is actually in physics. So there's this end body problem in physics where, uh, like, there's a bunch of planets or the thing, you know things in space, and you're given as input their locations and their masses, and you want to figure out what's the gravitational force on each one. Like, how do they how uh, when you sum together the gravitational forces that each pair of them uh, uh, applies to each other, what's what's the total gravitational force on each of the planets or the objects? Um, so uh, you'll recall from from maybe from physics class that if you have two planets and their masses are m u and m v, then the gravitational force of u on v is this in terms of like the gravitational constant and the product of their masses, and it's divided by uh, what's well, the the vector between them divided by the the cube of the distance between them? Uh, okay, and so uh, again, okay, there are some details I'm not telling you about, but you can again solve this problem by doing kernel density estimation for the the one over distance cubed kernel function, and then multiplying by appropriate vectors that take into account the masses and the locations. Um, and and this type of approach has also been used for for not just gravitation but other problems in physics like computing the magnetic field, uh, computing temperature diffusion, which apparently again uses the Gaussian kernel and, and some other applications like this. Okay, so let me mention one one last application, which is uh, I I figure many here will be interested in, so I even put it in the title of my talk, which is to this computational problem called attention. Um, so this is the computational problem at the heart of large language models like Transformer and Gemini and so on. Uh, all these models of a bunch of, of uh, units that, that have to repeatedly do this computational task every time they do training or inference. Yeah, and I'm, I'm guessing people at Google Research are familiar with this thing, and so I won't motivate it too much. Uh, but let me let me define kind of specifically what the computational problem is, just to make sure we're all on the same page about it. So in this attention problem, you're given as input three matrices. They're usually called the query, key, and value matrices. Um, and 
you again in kind of implicitly define this attention matrix, which is you do Q times K transpose, and then you entrywise exponentiate this this uh, this matrix. Um, and then you also do some rescaling. You define D to be the 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 diagonal matrix of of the row sums of of this attention matrix, so that D inverse times A just renormalizes A, so that's row sum to one. And then the goal is to output D inverse times A times uh, the final matrix V. Okay, so this is this is the the computational task that's performed over and over and over again in all these uh, different language models. Um, so uh, this is again a problem where kind of the straightforward algorithm takes about quadratic time. You just construct this n by n matrix A. You do all the things. It takes uh, n squared times m time once again. Uh, but uh, one thing I want to observe is that this is actually a really similar problem to KDE, and you can solve it with kernel density estimation. Um, so uh, let's say, just to simplify things a bit, uh, and you can actually assume this without loss of generality, that the rows of Q and the columns of K all have the same norm as each other, then uh, that means, you know, by some simple arithmetic that like the inner product between a row of Q and a column of K is just some rescaling of the distance between the, these two vectors. Like, uh, I don't know, you can, you can verify that this is always true. Um, and so in particular, the entries of the attention matrix are also just rescalings of uh, the entries of a Gaussian kernel matrix. Um, like, the you know, right? Oh. It's a bit laggy. Well, oh, this thing on the right is a is the is like a, a an entry of an appropriate Gaussian kernel matrix. Okay, and so uh, you can perform attention by just doing m plus one calls to kernel density estimation once to for the all ones vector to figure out that d matrix, and then for all of the columns of the matrix v. Uh, and and it's not so hard to prove that these two problems are are their computational complexities are basically equivalent. Uh, like either algorithms or lower bounds for one translate directly to algorithms or lower bounds for the other. Uh, okay, so uh, how big is well one one thing I sh I want to yeah emphasize before moving on is like how big is M in this in this application? Um, so here N is is the the length of the sequence that you're you're modeling in this attention unit. So like if you're using Gemini, it's like the length of the text that you input into Gemini. M is the length of like the vectors that are kind of built into the model that encode the words, or they're, they're usually called tokens. Um, and so in this case, uh, smaller M means that you're modeling a longer sequence. So like when, when M is smaller, that means like the input to your attention is bigger. Uh, so people usually, usually focus on M is like theta of log n, and they call this like the long sequence regime, where the the sequences you're dealing with are very long compared to the embedding dimension. So that's that's I think usually the the regime people care about here. Okay, and there are even more applications. I'm not really going to talk about spectral clustering and semi-supervised learning and and so on. Um, in this talk, so although most of what I'll say really does generalize to lots of kernel functions, I'm just going to focus on the Gaussian kernel, which comes up most often. Um, but but I do want to emphasize that different applications motivate different dimension regimes, different different values of m. Like in the the physics applications, for example, m is really a constant, like three, or often in you know low dimensional statistics, m might be a constant, or in a, if you're modeling very, very, very long attention, uh, m is quite small as well. Uh, maybe uh, m being theta log n is, is more common in high dimensional statistics or in modern machine learning, like in long sequence attention. Um, you could also uh, really reasonably consider high dimensional, the high dimensional case, uh, which I won't focus on today for kind of two reasons. One is that I think it's a bit less motivated than, than the others. And the second is that I have nice, clean, tight results for low and medium dimensions, and I have much less nice results for high dimensions. <laughs> so I don't want to mess things up by telling you about it. Okay. So let me tell you what our results look like. Um, so um okay the the type of question i'm asking uh here is is for the gaussian kernel 
what error epsilon can be achieved quickly in terms of these other parameters, the number of input vectors, the input dimension, and the square diameter. Um, so the, here's the, the type of result that we give. Uh, we show that in each of these dimension regimes, the low dimension and the moderate dimension case, uh, we give some threshold that depends on the other parameters, n and m and b, such that if one over epsilon is less than that threshold, then we give a really fast algorithm for kernel density estimation. If, if the, if the uh, kernel density estimation can be performed with error epsilon in, in near linear time, uh, if, if like uh, you don't need too small epsilon. Uh, by contrast, uh, we, we kind of complement each of these algorithms with a lower bound result that says if epsilon, one over epsilon is a lot bigger than the threshold, then kernel density estimation just cannot be performed for error epsilon in, in truly subquadratic time, even like n to the 1.99 time, assuming uh, the strong exponential time hypothesis. Uh, I'm not sure, I'm, I'm guessing maybe you're all familiar with strong exponential time hypothesis. It won't be super important for this talk, but let me just really briefly mention, this is a popular conjecture from fine grain complexity theory. Uh, it roughly, it's a strengthening of P is not equal to NP, which roughly asserts that our, our current best SAT algorithms can't be improved too much. So SAT roughly requires two to the end time. So assuming this conjecture, um, we show this, this that when one over epsilon is above this threshold, then kernel density estimation just can't be performed in subquadratic time. Um, so let me give you one example, uh, and then I'll give you the more general full result statement. So. Let's let's say we're focusing on the moderate dimension regime when m is like log n, and say we want polynomial error. Uh, then what we prove in this case is that if uh, b, the square diameter, is is smaller than log n, then you can achieve uh, polynomial error in near linear time. And by contrast, if b is at least log n, then you cannot achieve polynomial error even in any subquadratic time at all, assuming strong ETH. Um, so there's like a sharp threshold here, uh, depending on how big B is from going from a near linear time algorithm for the problem to a essentially quadratic time algorithm is required for the problem. Okay, so let me, here's the, here's the full more general result statement then. It's, it comes in this nice table. And like the goal of the rest of my talk is kind of to tell you about the four cells of this table. Um, okay, so here the, the, the middle row is talking about the low dimensional setting and the bottom row is talking about the medium dimensional setting. Um, and then on the left in this middle column, I show if this is the inequality such that if epsilon satisfies this inequality, then we can achieve a near linear time algorithm. So uh, in the low dimension setting, if log log one over epsilon is small of log n over m, then you can use an algorithm I'll tell you about called the fast multipole method to get a near linear time algorithm. And in, in medium dimension, you get this inequality instead. And then uh, to complement these algorithms, uh, we give these new recent lower bounds, assuming strong ETH, that if uh, one over epsilon is a little bit bigger than the just the threshold that gives a fast algorithm, uh, you get a lower bound that it's, it's impossible to achieve this epsilon uh, in in subquadratic time, assuming strong ETH. Uh, so like in these in these situations, there's a very tight uh, bound on what epsilon you can achieve in terms of the other parameters. Uh, yeah, okay, just to check any questions so far. Um, so for example, if down here, if you plug in B is small O of log N, you get to this, like, like the kind of I'll just on the previous slide, this this like example I mentioned, uh, if you plug in B is small O of log N, you, you get to this regime here where you get a fast algorithm. And if you plug in B is theta of log N, then it gives you a specific polynomial that you can't achieve that polynomial error in some quadratic time. Okay. Yeah. So in, in very low dimension, B doesn't matter? Yeah, in very low dimension, B ends up not matter. Is there, should I, is there some intuition for why uh yeah we'll see we'll see soon but the, basically there are space partitioning techniques you can use in low dimension to to remove the dependence on b that don't work once you get to moderate dimension thanks yeah okay so okay so again the goal for the rest of my talk is to tell you about these algorithms and or bounds um so so far we've introduced kde 
and I told you about applications, including to attention, uh, and I stated our results. Okay, so I'm first going to tell you about the moderate dimension algorithm, which uses a technique called the polynomial method, uh, which is one of my favorite algorithmic techniques. And then, then I'll tell you about the low dimensional algorithm, which uses the fast multipole method. Uh, this is very much not like a, in chronological order. The fast multipole method's been around for like 40 years, whereas this polynomial method is relatively new. Um, and then at the end, I'll tell you about the, our, how we prove our lower matching lower bounds. Okay, well, let's start with the polynomial method. So here's the plan. Uh, and again, I'll leave the kind of definition of the problem up in the corner. Uh, so the main idea is we're going to try to find a low rank approximation for the kernel matrix K. So not just a low rank approximation, but a low rank, uh, like a low rank decomposition for a pro an approximation of it. So our goal is going to be to compute these rectangular matrices L and R, which are N by okay, little R matrices, where think, think of R as a lot smaller than N, such that L times R transpose uh, is approximately equal to the kernel matrix K. Okay, then once we have these matrices, uh, then we can approximately do K times the vector multiplication very quickly by just doing uh, first R transpose times the vector, then L times that. Um, these are both just multiplying a matrix with N times R entries times a vector. So you can do them both in just in a straightforward way in N times R time. Uh, one thing I briefly wanna mention, for those of you who have met me before, you probably know one of my favorite things to do is apply uh, fast matrix multiplication to speed up a bunch of different algorithms problems. Um, and fast matrix multiplication is very fast in theory and kind of nebulous in practice. But what I think I wanna emphasize here is that we're not using anything like that here. This is like the very straightforward matrix times vector multiplication algorithm. And we're not gonna do anything fancier than that uh, anywhere in this, in this talk. Okay, so we're not like uh, invoking something super impractical in the background here. Okay, well that's that's the whole that's the whole algorithm, and what what do we need? Well, we just need this k tilde, like L times R transpose, to be a good approximation of k. Uh, like uh, for the kind of error we're aiming for, we just need in each entry the the difference is at most epsilon, and we need R to be small, like n to the little of one, so that this is an n to the one plus little of one time algorithm. Okay, so how are we going to do this? Well, the key uh, tool, which is kind of suggested by this name, the polynomial method, is going to be a polynomial approximation of the exponential function. Um, so here's the type of polynomial approximation I'm going to aim for. So there's going to be two parameters, b, like the, the magnitude of numbers we're going to plug in, and epsilon, the error we're willing to tolerate. Um, and what we want is a polynomial, this is like a single variable polynomial, or approximating a single variable function, such that for all inputs between minus b and b, the polynomial differs from e to the minus x by at most epsilon. Okay, and uh, we're going to use a polynomial approximation like this of degree, uh, okay, this expression. Uh, so, okay, it turns out you can get a polynomial like this whose degree is the maximum of these two quantities, squared of b log one over epsilon and log one over epsilon over log log one over epsilon over b. Okay, we'll we'll talk more about this a little bit later. Uh, but actually, one one thing I kind of want to emphasize before we move on is that actually the poly the like precise log log factors here, like in the denominator and the right term, were only nailed down in this. Uh, joint work with them all pretty recently. And these log log factors are gonna end up being very important for this algorithm. So yeah, look out for them later. Okay, but this is what we're gonna use. We'll use this polynomial approximation. Um, so what is the idea? Well, remember our goal is to compute these matrices L and R so that their product approximates K. Um, and recall, you know, we're talking about the Gaussian kernel. So the IJ entry of K is E to the minus Xi minus X, uh, Yj distance squared. Um, what we're going to do is is aim for our, we're going to take this polynomial P that epsilon approximates e to the, sorry, let's just say e to the minus X. Um, and our our approximation for the kernel is just going to be replace, oh, I see. Sorry, there should also not be a minus over here. Uh, uh, there should, yeah, this minus that would be there. Okay, our approximation for the entry of the kernel matrix will just be the polynomial evaluated at the distance instead of uh, actually taking e to the power of minus the distance. 
So that's how we're going to define our approximation. Um, and what I need to show you is how do we find these matrices L and R whose product gives this approximation K tilde. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so here is the plan. Well, uh, this polynomial evaluate at the distance, we can expand it out right like this. I'm just plugging in like the definition of what the distance is between the pair of points. Um, and when you expand this out, this is a polynomial in two M variables, like the M entries of X and the M entries of Y, and it's degree 2G. We plugged in a quadratic polynomial into a degree G polynomial. So when you expand it all out, it has uh, this binomial coefficient, 2M plus 2G, 2D, choose 2D, that 2M plus 2G, choose 2G, monomials. Okay. Uh, okay. So our goal is, again, we want to construct this, these L and R matrices. So for each Xi, we want to make a vector Li. Uh, okay. So I think these M should be R. Sorry about that. And for each Yj, we want to make a vector Rj so that the inner product between the rows and columns of the matrices L and R are going to evaluate the polynomial at these two points. Um, and we can do this by just expanding out the polynomial in terms of its monomials. So if we have our polynomial, we expand it out. For example, here are three monomials. Uh, then we'll separate out each monomial into like its X part and its Y part and put them into two separate vectors. So we can see the polynomial is the inner product of the vector of the x parts of each monomial and the vector of the y parts of each monomial. So the length of these vectors will be r, the number of monomials, and uh, the left one depends only on x, so we can form them into the L matrix, and the right one depends only on y, so we can form them into the R matrix. Um, so putting them all, this all together, this means we can solve the, this problem in time n times r, where r is the number of monomials in that polynomial. 2m plus 2g, choose 2g. Uh, and again, g is this expression for the, the degree to approximate e to the minus x. Okay, and, and, and this really kind of concludes the algorithm. And to go from here, uh, from, from from here, you when you have your specific choices of the parameters, you kind of plug them into this to see what R is and see what running time you get. But uh, let, so let me mention again, like this parameter regime where M is like log N and epsilon is one over poly N. Uh, so in this case, well, when, uh, so I told you the threshold here about B is at log N. So when B is small O of log N, there's supposed to be a near linear time algorithm. And, and we get it like this. So when B is small O of log N, then G is also small O of log N. Uh, you can see the left side is square root of small O of log N times log N. The right side is log N over something that's that's super constant. So it's also small O of log N. Um, so R, the number of monomials, will be like log N choose small O of log N, which is indeed N to the little of one. And you get a final running time of N to the one plus little O of one. And here the really the log log in the second term of the max ended up being very important. If that weren't there, uh, then the degree wouldn't be small O of log n anymore and, and we wouldn't get the same running time. Uh, and by contrast, when B is uh, like a constant times log n, then, then the number of monomials here is too big. You don't get a near linear time algorithm in this way. And in fact, as we'll see later, assuming strong ETH, it's just impossible to get a sub -quad, truly subquadratic time algorithm for this problem. Okay, so not only does this polynomial method not solve it quickly, but assuming strong ETH, it's just impossible to solve it quickly uh, when B is bigger than, than log n. Okay. Um, so let me return to this polynomial approximation a little bit, because I, I like this was kind of the 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 main technical power tool that we use and I, I didn't really tell you where it came from so let me tell you not not all the details but a little bit about where it came from because I think it's I think it's neat um, so the the key idea is to use a family of polynomials called Chebyshev polynomials um, so they're defined like this there there's like a family for each degree d there's a degree d Chebyshev polynomial q sub d uh, you can define it in this nice trigonometric way, like it's the polynomial such that 
when you plug in cosine of theta, you get uh, a rescaled cosine of d times theta for all theta. And if you remember your like trig identities from high school, maybe you'll realize from this definition that this has to be a polynomial. Uh, and if not, I can give you this different equivalent definition, which makes it very clear that it's a polynomial, or you just recursively define them in this nice arithmetic way. Okay, so this is a family of polynomials. Uh, here's like a picture of what one of them looks like. This is the degree 10 one. Um, they always have this nice property that uh, because of this trigonometric definition, they have this nice property that between minus one and one, they just wiggle up and down between minus one and one. Uh, but then once you're beyond minus one or beyond one, this trig definition doesn't apply anymore and they kind of blast off and grow quickly like a like a polynomial does. So th this is what they look like. And in fact, Chebyshev polynomials are known to have really nice extremal properties. Um, so one of them is that among all polynomials that have this property that I just said, like the, between minus one and one, they're bounded by, they're bounded in a rectangle. The Chebyshev polynomial is the one that maximizes the value outside of that interval between minus one and one at every point outside of that interval. So like for every polynomial that's bounded inside that re red rectangle I've drawn here, the Chebyshev polynomial achieves the biggest possible value at every point outside of the rectangle, every green point for a, for a fixed degree. So this is a really nice uh, extremal property that the Chebyshev polynomial has. And uh, this ends up being very relevant to approximating exponentials by polynomials. So, you know, if we're looking at the, the exponential function, it really looks like this. We're kind of on the right, it's like mostly flat, but on the left, it kind of blows up quite a bit to get to one. So using that extremal property, you can like immediately get a lower bound on the degree to approximate e to the minus x uh, by making use of Chebyshev polynomials. So if you had any polynomial that approximated e to the minus x, well, it would have to be within this red rectangle over here, because it has to be within delta of e to the minus x. And it would have to achieve at least this green point over here, because it has to get close to e to the zero, which is one all the way on the left. So you can figure out the minimum degree of a like appropriately shifted and rescaled Chebyshev polynomial that satisfies these two conditions and find that the degree gets ends up being like square root of b times log one over delta. And this, using the property from the last slide, implies a degree lower bound already that any polynomial approximating e to the minus x needs degree square root of b times log one over delta. Um, okay, and this is, uh, if you remember the, the statement of the degree, this is like the lower bound for one of the two branches of the maximum that ends up showing up. Okay, so um, kind of inspired by this, you can also use Chebyshev polynomials to actually construct upper bounds. So like actually construct good polynomial approximations. Um, so when you're trying to approximate a function like e to the minus x with polynomials, uh, probably the first thing you try, certainly the first thing I try is the Taylor series for the function. So you can write out its Taylor series. Uh, if you want a degree d approximation, you can truncate it by just topping off all but the first d or d plus one terms. This gives a pretty decent degree d approximation. But it turns out for a lot of functions, including e to the minus x, it's actually better to truncate the Chebyshev series instead. So that you can instead expand out the function as a series of Chebyshev polynomials with appropriate a sub j coefficients and truncate this series instead of the Taylor series. And this turns out to be better. So just even in like uh, really simple cases, like let's say we wanted to approximate e to the minus x on zero to one with degree four. Uh, then already, if you if you truncate the Taylor series, it looks like this. Uh, and if you truncate the che Chebyshev expansion, it looks like this. So you see some like waving up and down that's natural in these Chebyshev series. And the, the Taylor truncation gives like error 0 0.005. And the Chebyshev series already gives like one fifth as much error as the Taylor series does. So even in really small, simple cases, the Chebby using a Chebyshev series can make a big difference. Um, and, and more broadly, Chebyshev uh, series tend to give very uh, good polynomial approximations. Um, so let me like state one kind of lemma about this. So let's say f is any function who, whose Chebyshev series is this that you want to approximate. Um, and let's say p is the best possible, theoretically best possible degree d approximation to f. Then the, the maximum error 
uh, of between p and f is always bounded between by by these two functions uh, depending on the coefficients of the Chebyshev series. So the upper bound that is just the sum of the magnitudes of the a sub j's. This just comes from well, p can't can't be worse than the Chebyshev truncation, and that that upper bound is what you get from the Chebyshev truncation. The lower bound you have to be a little bit more careful, but use the fact that Chebyshev polynomials are are a family of orthogonal polynomials, and do some kind of L two analysis to get a lower bound as well. So you can you can both upper bound and lower bound how well you can do in terms of the Chebyshev series, and in particular if the if the co these Chebyshev coefficients decay quickly, which, for example, they do in the case of exponential functions, then uh, this says that the best you can do is really, really close to the like the d plus one uh, coefficient in the Chebyshev series. And for example, for e to the minus x, uh, uh, these two bounds are close to get close enough together that that this gives a very tight bound on how well you can approximate the the function by a low degree polynomial or what degree you need to approximate it. So okay, so that's the idea. And but uh, I just want to mention this is a pretty general approach that that can work for many different kernel functions. If there's other ones other than Gaussian kernel that you're interested in. Um, okay, so let me move on now to the low degree or the low dimension algorithm. So we've been talking so far about the moderate dimension algorithm, which just used this polynomial method. Um, in low dimension, actually, you can do that same thing. You can do the polynomial method, and it already works better than it did in the, the moderate dimension case. So if you'll recall, you know, we end up solving the problem in n times r time, where r is this, this binomial coefficient, like 2m plus 2g to 2m, and g was that degree. But if m is smaller, because uh, the dimension is smaller, then this binomial coefficient is smaller. Uh, so you can handle a larger degree and still get a near linear time algorithm just right away. Um, so, for example, uh, when m is a constant, like in those physics applications, say, uh, you can already get polynomial error for all the way up to n to the little o, o of one uh, square diameter. Whereas remember before, we needed little o of log n. So there's a much bigger square diameter. Um, okay, you can do this, but I want to tell you briefly about uh, something that's even better than this that you can do. And again, this is this is an algorithm that's been known for a long time. Uh, yeah, for example, for constant uh, dimension, you can actually achieve like one in two to the end of the little o of one error. And it's like independent of B. So like much smaller error and no matter what B is. Okay, so the idea is to use this algorithm called the fast multiple method that was introduced by Green Guard and Rocklin. Um, and this is a this is a this is a interesting algorithm. It's somehow a very well known algorithm. Like um, you might be familiar in in two thousand, there was this uh, this issue of the journal Computing and Science and Engineering where they listed the top ten algorithms of the twentieth century, like the ten algorithms that were most impactful. And whenever I hear about this thing, I think people are always talking about the fast Fourier transform. They always say the fast Fourier transform was one of the ten most impactful algorithms. People seem to talk less about the other ones, but actually number 10 on their list was the fast multiple method. Um, so it, it's a, somehow despite being on this list, uh, I didn't actually know so much about it until recently. Uh, I'm guessing maybe some of you also don't know so much about it. So I wanna tell you at least a little bit about how this multiple method works. And they, again, were motivated in the first place by these physics applications and really focusing on like constant M. Okay, so here, here's the, the plan, and this is all, I'm going to give you a, a simplified version of this method. Um, okay, so the key idea is we're going to partition all of our space into boxes. Okay, we're going to do some space partition, and then we're going to figure out the kernel matrix times the vector by summing the contribution of each pair of non-empty boxes. Okay, uh, so at first, this might seem like a bad idea. There could be n different non-empty boxes. Maybe this sounds like an n squared time algorithm, but we'll we'll deal with that. So here's like the the first yeah. So here's like a a picture of what partitioning space into boxes looks like. You end up using a data structure called a quad tree to do this, but doesn't matter so much for the for the purposes of this talk. Okay, you, you partition up things in boxes, and we're going to sum over pairs of boxes. Okay, so uh, remark one is that. If two boxes 
are far away from each other, then we don't have to bother adding their contribution to the final result. Uh, if they're farther, if they're far apart, then the kernel evaluate the e to the minus distance squared evaluated at the pair of points will be uh, will be less than epsilon, and so we can just replace it with zero, and we'll still just contribute to the epsilon error that we're willing to tolerate in the problem. So. Uh, in dimension M, we only need to, to consider something like N times the number of boxes that are close enough, which is something like log one over epsilon to the power of M uh, pairs of boxes. So uh, because of this, we when M is small and epsilon is not too big, we only need to consider a linear number of pairs of boxes instead of a quadratic number of pairs of boxes. Okay, so this is, this is the first trick. Uh, the, second, the second main idea is actually to use kind of the polynomial method again but to use a way lower degree polynomial. So what they observe is that if two boxes are well separated from each other, then you can actually just use a constant degree polynomial to approximate e to the minus x very well. Uh, where by well separated, I mean, you know, there's some d such that, you know, all the distances are say at least d and at most 2d. So they're not, they can't get too close to zero. So just to give some, some intuition from the, you know, our, our picture of e to the minus x from before, uh, like our, our lower bound here came from the fact that you have to like simultaneously be small in this red box and also be really big near zero at the green point. But if we only needed to approximate the function well, like in this red box that's far away from zero, then like this extreme uh, behavior isn't really kicking in just in the red box. The function is actually quite small everywhere. And you can actually find a constant degree polynomial that when you work out the details that approximates the function well. So in that case, you can actually deal with these well-separated boxes very quickly uh, by using a constant degree polynomial in a way very similar to what we did before. So what do you do with boxes that are close to each other where this extremal property is kicking in? Well, uh, this, this requires some more details that I'm kind of skimming over, but what they do is actually just partition space into more and more smaller boxes until all the non-empty boxes are well-separated from each other. So that's why in the picture here, you know, in these denser areas where there are points closer together, they partition the points into smaller and smaller boxes until for every pair of boxes, any points in them are, are sufficiently far away from each other. That's the whole idea. You, you partition up space, you only need to consider a linear number of pairs of boxes, and then uh, you can actually use a constant degree polynomial to deal with each pair of boxes. And that's the, the multiple method, which is, is very effective in this low dimension regime. Okay, presented a little bit differently from how they present it. Uh, does this constant degree polynomial, does that degree blow up that constant as you recurse on it and get smaller boxes, or does that end up staying? Uh, no, it, it depends only on um, like the the factor of what you mean by well separated, like the factor of two here. Okay. Yeah, the the part that blows up as you get smaller boxes, like there's a some data structure problem about figuring out what the boxes are and which ones are non-empty. But the, the polynomial ends up being a scaled version of the exact same thing, no matter how small they are. Nice, yeah. yeah. And, and, uh, and, and here you also don't have to be super careful about which polynomial you're using. You can increase the degree a little bit and, and it, doesn't, it doesn't hurt the running time very much. Okay, so, so I've, I've now shown you the two algorithms on the, like, the middle column of this tab. Uh, like, yeah, there's this like the multiple method works when like log log of one over epsilon is small of log n over m because, you know, there's like the log one over epsilon to the n is the dependence in the running time that shows up. Um, so let me now uh, in the last 10 minutes or so tell you about the lower bounds showing that both of these these algorithmic approaches are, are very close to tight and you, you can't achieve much better epsilon in some quadratic time. Okay. Um, so here is here is our idea. Um, what I'm going to show you is that if you can solve a kernel density estimation with appropriate parameters in subquadratic time, then you can use that to also solve another problem called the Hamming closest pair problem in subquadratic time. So I'm going to reduce from the Hamming closest pair problem to kernel density estimation. Um, and I'll mention in a second, this Hamming closest pair problem is known already to require quadratic time, assuming the strong exponential time hypothesis. Uh, and so this together means that uh, kernel density estimation will require quadratic time as well. 
So that's our plan. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a few assumptions to just simplify the presentation in this talk uh, to make our lives easier. First, I'm going to focus on moderate dimension, like log n. Um, and second, I'm going to focus on what are called radial kernels, where the kernel depends just on the um, I'm using notation a little bit and using f on both sides here, but the, it depends only on the squared distance between the points. Um, but for example, our polynomial kernel and our Gaussian kernel that we've been considering so far are both radial kernels. Um, but uh, I'll just mention that similar ideas to what I'm going to say work for other dimension regimes and other types of kernels as well. Okay. So let me uh, introduce the Hamming closest pair problem. Uh, so in this problem, uh, it's another type of problem where you're given n x points and n y points. Uh, here they're just they're just uh, binary vectors. Like there's zero one points of dimension d, and d is about we're thinking of as like log n. Um, and the goal is just to determine the closest pair in like Hamming distancer because there's there's zero one points. You can use whatever distance you want. Um, um, so there's, as always, a straightforward like n squared times d about quadratic time algorithm where you just compare each pair of points and see how close they are. Um, the fastest known algorithm is just a little bit faster than this. Uh, it turns out in dimension c times log n, you can solve it in time n to the 2 minus something like 1 over square root of c. So it's like for any fixed constant c, there actually is a subquadratic time algorithm for the problem. But as c gets large, the, the running time approach is quadratic. Um, and this is not super important, but I mention it mostly because actually this algorithm uses the polynomial method as well. So we're kind of relating here two problems whose fastest known algorithms both use the polynomial method. Um, okay. And it's known that assuming the strong exponential time hypothesis, uh, basically you can't solve this quad problem in truly subquadratic time for dimension order log n. So for every delta, there's a C such that when you're in dimension c times log n, you can't get running time n to the two minus delta. Okay, this is a, if you're familiar with stuff, this stuff this is a relatively easy uh, set hardness result to prove. Okay, so we're gonna now uh, use kernel density estimation to solve the Hamming closest pair problem and thus get our lower bound. So here's our, our first approach. This is an approach that was, I think, first introduced by backers and in Dick and Schmidt in 2017. Uh, as an approach for solving Hamming closest pair using kernel density estimation. Um, and what they're going to do is they're going to suppose this function f is very rapidly decreasing. So like suppose that for any distance p, if you look at the ratio of the function at, at p divided by the function at p plus 1, it's always like bigger than n squared, let's say. So it's decreasing really, really, really quickly. So in this case, you can solve the closest pair problem by just summing up all the entries of the kernel matrix by just computing like one transpose times kernel matrix times one, which you can do using kernel density estimation. And then in that case, the answer to the closest pair problem is just the minimum P such that that sum of all the entries is between F of P and N squared F of P. Just like the function is decreasing so rapidly that whichever entry corresponds to the smallest distance can't be swamped out by all n squared other entries in the whole matrix. Okay, this is a very simple, uh, a very, very simple thing. And, and it does work and, and give some kinds of lower bounds. But the one issue is that uh, it, it really needs either f to be very rapidly decreasing, or the diameter of your points to like be really big so that this can show up. So like, for example, if you scale your binary vectors by a factor of like log n, then it, then it, uh, will work. Oh, sorry. Uh, and then it will work, but you either need like kind of some scaled version of the Gaussian kernel, or you need like, uh, a diameter of like log squared n and really, we really want to get hardness for like the Gaussian kernel and for diameter log n. So it, it it's, a uh, it's uh, just doing this is a little bit far off from proving what we want. Okay, so we're going to use a, a new a new idea. Uh, I think this, at least uh, the first time I know about this being used was in this joint work with Tim Chu and Aaron Schild and Zhao Song from a few years ago. Uh, and recently uh, with Yun Feng, we figured out how to kind of get tight bounds using this approach. 
Um, so the, uh, the idea is to, instead of just doing one kernel density estimation and using that to figure out the answer, we're going to perform many kernel density estimations and then combine their answers somehow to figure out the answer to the Hamming closest pair problem. Um, so, so let me make a definition. So for these two points, that's X and Y, where we're trying to find the, the Hamming closest pair for these points, let's define the distance vector. So this is a vector of like dimension plus one, uh, whose like entry P is just the number of pairs that have distance P. Okay, so this is a, this is a this is a vector is unknown to us when we're just given as input the vectors at the x and y points, um, but determining this vector suffices to solve the Hamming closest pair problem. Like if we had this vector, we could just look at what's the smallest entry that's non-zero, and that corresponds to the distance of the closest pair. Okay, um, but one nice thing is that you you can view kernel density estimation as taking linear measurements of this distance vector. So like when you sum all the entries of the kernel matrix using kernel density estimation, this just gives you the linear sum, like the kernel value at P times the pth entry of the vector. So it gives you this sum. Uh, so it's telling you some information about the distance vector. Um, and then more generally, uh, we could choose some scaling factor alpha and scale all the input points by a factor of alpha and then do kernel density estimation with these new rescaled points instead. And now we get a different linear measurement in terms of f of alpha times the distance instead of f of the distance. So if we do this for uh, d plus one different choices of alpha, uh, then these d plus one different linear measurements we get really are giving us the matrix vector product m times v, where m is this matrix whose like i comma p entry is the kernel function f, like e to the minus x, evaluated at uh, the scaling factor alpha times p. Okay, so this is what we get from doing these d plus one kernel density estimations. And then if m is an invertible matrix, which it basically always is, uh, then you can recover v from, from this m times v that you got from the kernel density estimates by solving a linear system. So this is the idea. You can do these d plus one different KDEs and actually just recover the whole distance vector v. Okay, there's one there's one kind of last issue, which is that uh, we don't actually get m times v from these kernel density estimations. We only get, get an approximation. Like we give we get some vector alpha, sorry, a, I guess, such that uh, uh, a differs from m times v by at most epsilon times n in each entry, just because uh, our KDE algorithm only gives us an appro epsilon approximation, not the exact value. So we can't just directly solve a linear system and we're done. Uh, but what we're going to do is just solve this linear system anyway. So we'll multiply m inverse times this approximate vector anyway. And whatever we get, we're going to round it to the nearest integer vector. And this will work as long as th there's not too much error, as long as the m inverse times the vector a uh, differs from the real answer v in by less than half in each entry, so that when you round it to the nearest integer, it'll give the correct vector. Uh, can I just, I have two minutes left, is that right? <laughs> okay, I'll, 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 I only have a couple more slides. Um, so, so, okay. So just to reiterate where we're at so far, what we have from this algorithm is a vector A, which differs from M times V by at most epsilon N in each coordinate. And what we wanna prove to show that our algorithm's correct is that M inverse times A differs from V by at most half in each coordinate. Um, so to do this, we're going to define this quantity about the matrix M uh, is defined in this way, the maximum over non-zero vectors U of the infinity norm of M inverse times U divided by the infinity norm of U. So if you've seen like the operator norm of a matrix before, this is very similar, but it's uh, we're using like the L infinity norm instead of the L2 norm. So it's the it's a bit less nice, basically. But uh, but this is the one you end up needing to use here. Um, then, then you can see that the the quantity we're trying to bound, the that we want to be less than a half, uh, you do some arithmetic, and it's at most uh, t this quantity tau times epsilon times n, the error of our vector of vector a that we were given. Um, so, if if tau is a uh, is is big enough so that or small enough rather so that epsilon is less than one over two times tau times n, 
then this quantity, this bound is less than a half, and this will be a correct algorithm for, for recovering the counting vector. Um, so the, the proving the correctness of the algorithm then reduces to this mathematical question of figuring out what is tau of m. Like m doesn't depend on the inputs at all, it's just a function of the kernel function f that we're dealing with. Uh, and I'll, I'll just quickly mention, uh, so here's the definition again. One nice thing is that, uh, so recall, yeah, M is this matrix that depends on just the kernel function and the scaling factors alpha that we get to pick. Uh, one nice thing is that for a lot of kernel functions of interest, this matrix M is like a nice, very well understood matrix. So for example, when we're dealing with the Gaussian kernel, you can see that M actually is a Vandermond matrix. Uh, I'll let you verify that for yourself. Or, or similarly, if F is some polynomial kernel, M is something called a Cauchy matrix. So these kinds of matrices and their inverses are very well understood. Uh, and for these families, we know like closed form expressions for the inverse of M, and you can do a lot of arithmetic and actually just compute what this tau of M has to be. Uh, but in general, uh, figuring out tau of M is not so easy. And if you have a, a different kernel function, you might need to you know, do some more analysis to, to bound it exactly. Okay, but that's that's the whole idea behind the reduction. Okay, uh, and here's just the table of results again. Uh, thanks. <laughs> Any questions? Oh, maybe one question. Do you know, like, for attention, what epsilon is relevant? Uh, so, so my understanding is, you, so usually, usually you want um, it, it. It depends on the details of your your like transformer network, as I say. But but you want to like you know the errors accumulate over. There's a bunch of layers and a bunch of heads that whose errors add up together, and then they accumulate over each layer. Usually, if you if the error is one over polynomial and n then the total error at the end will also be one over polynomial n, which, uh, so at least in the, yeah, in, in most papers about the theory of these things, people take one over polynomial n epsilon. I see. Yeah. Does this reduction give you a useful algorithm for like a hamming nearest neighbor or whatever at all, or? Uh, is it just a lot worse than the actual <laughs> algorithms? I think, uh, okay, if you just work out the parameters of what this gives, it's it's worse than our best known algorithm. I, I think there's a weird thing where here you're like, the, like you pick a particular kernel function, like the like Gaussian kernel or whatever, and you're like a little bit constrained that you have to use that one, mm -hmm. and then you go through this whole process. But if you're allowed to pick the best possible kernel for solving the Hamming closest pair problem, I think it would end up tying the best known algorithm. Mm. So like there is a kernel that would be good, but it's not the Gaussian kernel. But it's still, even for the Gaussian kernel, uh, ends up giving tight lower bounds for, for a lot of these settings. Yeah, so Josh, this is really cool work. Uh, it's uh, amazing. Uh, so uh, I have a small question regarding your choice of the championship polynomials. Um, like you showed that uh, for certain polynomials, like uh, uh, each of negative x, you get smaller deltas. Uh, so what about the convergence speed compared to Taylor polynomials? Like I'm curious on what your suggestions are to when to choose Taylor and when to choose Chebyshev. And I think the Chebyshev computation uh, complexity might be a little higher, although that's uh, probably not a big issue here. Like, so, so when would you choose uh, which approximation method? Uh, I'm yeah, that's that's a great question. There's actually like uh, there's like whole textbooks in this area. It's called approximation theory in math, where they like there's whole textbooks where like each chapter they pick a different function of interest and like figure out what its coefficients are in the, all these different types of series and figure out which one converges the fastest and which one's the most appropriate to pick. So the like the the short answer is it kind of depends a lot on what function you're dealing with. But but there is a, a nice theorem that follows from what I talked about before, which is that the Chebyshev truncation is always close to optimal. So it always by like a if, if it's possible to achieve degree D somehow, the Chebyshev truncation will always give degree at most D 
d times log d. So it's always, always only a little bit worse. Sometimes like in these algorithms, like the degree ends up being in the exponent. And so the extra log d can hurt you. But a lot of the time, for example, in the fast multiple method, the log d doesn't really matter. Uh, and you can just kind of you always use the Chebyshev truncation and not worry about it too much. But but the, the real answer is it, it probably depends a lot on what your function is. You have to do some calculations or, or look up in a reference like how, how the different series converge. And, yeah, and there, there are other other than Taylor and Chebyshev series, there is also like people frequently use Hermite polynomials, for example, and there, there are other examples like that.